So I, we've talked for a little bit before we started recording, and I didn't say anything because I wanted to call you out on the recording. Okay. Jimmy? Yeah, I had a feeling you were talking to me. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you drove through my town, past yes. my town, yes, just north, and had lunch with two of my friends yes. and didn't even call me, didn't even let me know. You were invited? And then threw the trash I was in not the invited. yard as he drove by. <laughs> <laughs> I was not you invited. invited. We, I drove past your house at like midnight, so I didn't think you'd want to knock on me knocking on your door at midnight and asking you how come your truck isn't running. Because you didn't want that. <laughs> oh. I, no, I, we drove through late, late, late at night. We came from Atlanta, and we left Atlanta late because we thought, ah, it's only it's a couple, it's only six hours. It's not 15 or 18. And so we drove through, we checked in into Louisville at like 1 a.m. And that was pretty scary because Louisville seems like, it, like I felt like it was on the set of Omega Man, the first one from the 70s. Mm. Did you ever go into Louisville, like downtown? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, is, it's scary. Yeah. I didn't think my yeah. truck was going to be there when I came out from checking in. And they did have a parking lot, thankfully. And I, the first night, I just stared at my truck from the window of the hotel room the entire time, mm. hoping it would be there when I woke up, when I finally Wait, woke up. Wait, the first night? Sitting. That means you were in Louisville for two nights and you still didn't call me? Yeah, that's right. I didn't oh call you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, we're the done. First day, this the first podcast day, is over. I am offended. No, after a couple of days of... Maker camp, uh, workbench camp, con work. You know. <laughs> <laughs> workbench camp con at the hotel. I was just spent. Rachel was spent, so we just spent the first day just vegging out and wandering around. And then that night we went to dinner with other guys from Bullet because it was a Bullet Bourbon event in Louisville. And then the next day I went to meet the guys at First Build. I went and said hi to some of the guys, Colin and Tim, and and Josh was there, of course, and then. Anthony came and we went to a Mexican restaurant at about noon. And while we were eating, I got the message from my guy Bobby, who's like, "You got to be in Shelbyville by three. And so that meant I had to get Rachel, scoop her up, get everybody ready, get everything ready, and shoot out to Shelbyville on Tuesday and do all that. And the event went really well. It was a simple thing. I made lots of boxes, the whiskey boxes, and I also made lots of coasters. Yeah. And they're introducing a new malt liquor, and this was, they had two shifts of about 50 people each, and each one of these people are our versions of what we do, influencers and and bloggers for the liquor industry. A couple of the guys I ended up chatting with at that event have millions of followers. It's crazy. And one guy's like, oh yeah, how many got on Instagram? He goes, like a million two, I think. And a couple of these guys videotaped me. What, what they... What I was there for was I brought a set of monogram stamps and I stamped the coasters, the leather coasters that I made. So if you wanted your initials, I stamped your initials or maybe a short word or something. And some people took some as, some as gifts for colleagues and family and they got into it. I didn't think it would be a big deal, but a lot of people did get into it and they filmed me stamping their coasters and giving them, giving them to them. And uh, the event went good. But then... So all night on, was that Monday night? I can't remember. Yeah, all night on Monday night hanging out with the crew, and then all night on Tuesday night, and then yesterday morning at 9 o'clock, I left. And then I was going to blow off chops with Chris, only because we were just running short on time. And then he sent me his address, and I, I, I was like, I'm never going to pass by here ever again. So I s swung in, and we hung out with him for about a half hour, videotaped a couple of little vlog interviews, and then boogied and got home at about 2 a.m. So is that so, what it, should I have emailed you my address? Is that why? <laughs> that that would have helped. <laughs> the, oh. great, the great thing was he sent Dang photos it. to us. It's almost yes. like, hey, check this out. I'm in your area, not with you. Here's some photos. From lunch, oh. from the table. From, like he, yeah. It wasn't even like two days later. Oh, I forgot to send you guys these. Look where I am right now and you're not. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. Bob, out of respect, I just I let you have your space. You, you, you like your space. You got a lot going on. Yeah, but I, I like you too. Next oh, time you come you through here, yeah, please let's just have lunch or something. Well, you said wave from the car. That's what you said. Something like that. <laughs> a couple of fans wrote to me like, "Did you, did you, did you wave to Bob when you drove past us?" I did. Yeah. What is right. that? Sixty-seven that goes north up from Nashville. Uh, is it 65. 60, 65. Yeah. yeah. When we got kind of about thirty miles south of Louisville, I waved, and I figured maybe Bob will see this. <laughs> 
Well, I didn't because I was asleep. <laughs> yeah, see? That's what I want to bother you. Well, I mean, to be fair, I've never been to your house. And you have been to my house. So, All right. Yeah. So the, t- the scales are unbalanced at this point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you got to come me. to Workbench Con Camp Outdoor Hangout. <laughs> okay. October. <laughs> Jimmy Camp. Yep. Yeah, Jimmy will, Camp. I will come What's funny is that a lot of people in the, a lot of people at Workbench Con assume even the even some of the heavy hitters I was talking to like the the guys that you know have dinner by themselves without any fans some of those guys <laughs> Bob's laughing <laughs> there's a group of guys that have dinner no fans so a bunch of those guys thought that workbench con was sorry a lot of those guys thought that maker camp was exclusively me and it's not workbench workbench can't just <laughs> get this trip <laughs> Maker Camp is in my neighborhood. I'm not partners in it. I, I don't take anything from it. I simply just help promote it because it's here. And it brings business to the town. And all my friends come to town. So that's the benefit I get out of it, is that all my friends come to town for one day a year. And I don't have to travel far to what is now turning out to be one of the most fun events that, that takes place. And Austin Handel, who owns, whose family owns the Blackthorn Resort, Austin is the main point man for... And the and the creator of Workbench Camp, Maker Camp. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> that last one was a joke. Maker Camp. So yeah. and and Austin was at Workbench Con. Austin came just to just brush up and say hi to people because at this point, Austin's a big part of what what happens in the maker community as far as gatherings. Hmm. And he came to just meet sponsors and people and fans and people that come to the event. Just to get a vibe for what else is going on. Him and Kristen are friendly. They've they've collaborated on a couple of concepts. Oh, they've talked about a couple of concepts for potential collaborations. And Kristen comes to make her bench camp every year. <laughs> Work bench. That was even I was trying to be funny, but I just. <laughs> I think she comes I think Jimmy's to sleepy. Um, Catskill. Kristen has come to Catskill Mountain make her camp and enjoyed the festivities. She she has a lot of fun. She did a little blacksmithing, sewing. Mm. You know, all the different things that take place. Cool. Well, I'm Jimmy, sorry. you can take a nap. Take a nap, and then David I'll can take a nap. Wake me up when the subject starts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what have you been doing, David? This Every year I take this particular week off and don't do a whole lot. So I... Um, so today is would be my dad's birthday, and then tomorrow would be the anniversary of his death. And so... Typically every year, I, I use this week and not not film. I'll get my taxes ready, so I have to go through and categorize different transactions and stuff, and hand that off to my tax guy. And then I'll make the trip to my hometown, and and uh, I, it's one of those things I just kind of drive around, visit old places, and uh, yeah. So I'm not real. So I didn't do any work this week, but. I'm getting ready to for next week. I'm going to start making some skateboards, and Ooh. yeah. Um, spoiler alert: My pick of the week is, uh, is this website called SkateCAD, and it is phenomenal. You, it's a it's a 3D skateboard modeling app. Uh, you can use the free version, um, and you can Whoa. you can spit out different types of boards. And then you can make adjustments to all those, all kinds of crazy adjustments. And not only does it spit out a 3D model for the board, it spits out a 3D model for the mold. So if you are doing a press, you'll get the male female mold. Uh, if you're doing a vacuum press, you just need the male part. It is, it's phenomenal. Um, wow. this yeah. Is really cool. So I. I went and I bought I bought a month of the pro version. I also bought a, a consultation session with the the guy that that runs it. You can use the free version. You can get everything you want out of the free version. Um, but I wanted to. So I had a one on one with the guy yesterday, just because I'm like, hey, I'm not a skateboarder, but I like the all the art and culture of skateboarding, and I want to make some that are just purely art for hanging on the wall. And he kind of walked me through some um, some things, some things I should know for vacuum pressing and things like that. So I'm getting ready to do that. And the skateboards that I'm making, 
the art is all going to be like a marquetry veneer type thing. And so I'm preparing myself for that. But it is, it's a really, really cool website. Had no idea this existed. And then I've, I came across a couple of really cool YouTube channels where, I mean, I, I knew that people make skateboards, but it's really cool to see people make the different types of skateboards and how, and there's many ways of going about it, whether you've got fancy tools or you don't have fancy tools. And then, uh, I've also got, I, I forgot about fingerboards and handboards, which are miniature versions and you can apply all the same hand techniques. Boards. So I'm really into this right now. I'm taking a bunch of notes, getting ready to, to do this. And I don't have my, I'm going to make 10 of them that I hope to, I bought enough veneers to do 11. I'm hoping I can get 10 out of there, maybe one one screw up. And I'm hoping to have 10 different ones that I could possibly sell. And I haven't quite figured out what the design is gonna be. I'm thinking maybe all 10, if they were together, it would be one piece of art that would flow between them, but then sell them individually. Or I might do 10 different ones. We'll see. But uh, that's what I'm working on now to start shooting next week. Cool. Man, that yeah. sounds pretty awesome. That that website looks really cool. It, I, I, it's, it, it's just it's huh. phenomenal that some dude just made this website. It's, it's like Fusion 360, yeah. but for skateboards. And way very simpler. Very specific. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's that's so cool. Can I tell you guys a story about handboards? Yeah, you know the hand, you were talking about handboards. I've never when even I heard was of a handboard. When I was a teacher in the in the '90s at the School of Visual Arts, one of my students, his name is Esau Andrews. You can look him up. Esau now is a, he's a successful uh, fine art painter, but Esau is a skater. He's from like a, a skater skater culture, and I think he might even be from LA. I'm not sure, but he came to me and said, I have an idea. He said, a lot of guys are doing this, but I, he goes, I started doing it on my own, and then I see other people doing it. He makes these little tiny skateboards for his hands, and he does all the kick flips and does all the tricks, and he made a little environment for them. And he says, do you think I could sell this into the toy business? And I said, I don't know, I'll get you some meetings. So I gave him some contacts, and he was able to sell it. That to Tech Deck, I think was the name of the company. Oh, yeah. In the 90s. So the very first handboards were from Esau, my student huh. in the 90s. And then it became a huge category. And I said to him, I said to him, uh, do you do you still get paid? And he, he said, no. He, he goes, they just stopped paying me. And I called up and they're like, you got paid enough. Something like that. And like, <laughs> he did, but he did make several, I think he, he kind of implied he made several thousands of dollars. And an another thing, this is just a little bit more of a heartwarming story. I haven't talked to him in years, and now he lives near me. He lives in Hudson, and he reached out to me, and, and he said, uh, he goes, hey, can we get together? And we did, and, and he had something heavy on his heart. I didn't know what it was. And he says, I want to talk to you. Um, he goes, I always feel, I feel bad that I thought you were mad at me because when I did the tech deck thing, and you know, I, I, I skated out because I thought that you wanted money and there was a miscommunication, and I thought you were upset with me. And he and I had like a tearful hug, and I said, I didn't think about that at all. Like, and he just miscommunicated that. Like, he just misunderstood that. And I, not for one second, did I want any money from him at all. And so we had a nice hug, and, you know, we've reconnected over that. And so it was, it was really, it was a sweet moment. But, you know, sometimes people think one thing, and, you know, it's not even the thing at all. You know, and years go by. Hmm. And then you, you connect, and it never was what you thought it was. It was nothing. It wasn't anything. That's really cool that he reached out to, to like, set, you know, set the level and like figure yeah. out. You know? Yeah, because wow. I mean, he was just I'm like, what did, you know, the most he probably made, I don't even know, I mean, 75, 50 grand, you know, to a student, that's a huge amount of money. Like, why do, I'm not gonna take that from, I wasn't even thinking that. I just made the connection for him. Me and my brother actually made the connection for him and that was it. And we, we lost touch, but he thought that I was mad at him, but I was never mad, Esau, I'm not mm. mad at you, you know that, he knows that by now. <laughs> but anyway, he was the first person that, that had anything to do with those handboards now they're everywhere it's a complete category of toys so there you go hmm. yeah it's funny i've i've seen the fingerboards before yeah. but i've never ever heard of a handboard and now i'm looking them up and yeah there's a ton of them and it's, it's a like really a interesting right? size they're, yeah. they're yeah. like 11 inch or yeah. something is that how yeah. they are that's pretty wild this whole thing started like i've always 
Um, I've always been, I've had skateboards. I could never do any anything but just ride on it. I've, um, I've always hung out with the skaters and then I've always kind of wanted to make one. And I'm like, well, maybe someday I'll, I'll do that and then I'll just do it for art. And then a few months ago, Eames, as in Ray and Charles Eames, their um, whatever's left, like there's there's still an Eames company. And they teamed up with uh, somebody else to do custom boards. And so they have, there was this line of ex- skateboards released that looked like the Eames lounge chair and that had uh, those colors mixed in there. And I was just like, man, I would love to have one of those hanging on the wall. It just looks so cool. And you know it's pretty expensive, so I never I never got one. And then uh, another channel that I follow, Ten Hundred, just did a skateboard painting video last week or the week before, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to finally do this. I'm, and so then I just went down the whole rabbit hole of collecting information, watching videos. I've got a book called The Handmade Skateboard that was put out by the same publisher that did my books, and uh, and book. and here we are. It's like it's my it's my current obsession right now. So I think that guy Matt Berger. That guy sent me. Yeah, Matt Berger. He sent me. Yep, that that's book. the book. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Or maybe he didn't send it, but like his publisher or yeah. whatever. For some reason, I have had that for a really long time. It's got a quote by Nick Offerman on the front of it too. Yeah. What does it say? Anyway. It says, I skateboard a lot. No, it says this elucidating treatise will elevate your skateboard shop skills. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a total Nick Hofferman thing to say. Yep. So I think between the three of us, though, uh, Bob, elucidating. you probably have the most skateboarding experience, right? You... Uh, yeah, I mean, a little bit. I don't know how much you guys skated, but... <clears throat> None. I skated never. <laughs> I skated a little bit when I was younger. I was mostly a rollerblade guy in college. I was good on rollerblades. And when I was in middle school, or yeah, middle school, I guess that was like the heyday. That was the, that was the big street skate, you know, kind of mm-hmm. era when it started. And <clears throat> I remember my parents didn't want to buy me a skateboard. And all my friends who were all the skaters all had, you know, they would break boards all the time, and they would get new boards and whatever. And <clears throat> excuse me, since I didn't have one, I remember one day after school, my friend Brian showed up with a board and they had taken all of the parts they took somebody's old deck that was still usable but pretty busted up they took somebody else's trucks that were had been replaced somebody else's wheels somebody else's bearing and they built me a a used skateboard out of all their old parts and gave it to me so that i could go skate with them and i remember it was a martinez that's a guy right skater guy Mm. martinez board it was a board that like is a famous board, and I remember it was it was trashed, you know, like still worked, but it was had it was very used. And um, so I had this skateboard for a little while, and I skated with them for a year or so, and then, you know, people at that age just start going in different directions and stuff, and so I kind of stopped hmm. skating with them. Um, it's funny though because over the years, when I was in college, at the end of college, or maybe even after. Um, my buddy Adams and I, who used to rollerblade all the time, we were just one night like, hey, we should buy skateboards. We should we should start skating. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, you know, like one of those late night things. And so we started skating. And I started learning how to actually do things. Uh, I remember I landed a kickflip for the first time. And I was just like, what? That's so cool. And then maybe an hour later, I rolled my ankle and it popped really loud. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of my skating career. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, so to this day, that was 25 years ago or something. I don't know. It was a long time ago. To this day, at the end of the day, I can wiggle my ankle, my right ankle a little bit. After I've been standing on it all day, I can wiggle it and it pops in the exact same way that oh. it did that night. And I remember that. And it doesn't hurt. It's just like yeah, something changed that night. I hope the editor puts Um, in a little popping sound right there. (laughs) But about six months ago, maybe not even that long, my second oldest boy, um, he's, he's in middle school and he was like, he skateboarded a little bit, but he, he doesn't know how to do anything. He just likes to ride it around in the, in the driveway. He was like, 
I think I want to get a new skateboard. And I'm like, well, you know, we've done this before. You've bought a board. You don't really use it, whatever. And he's like, well, I'm going to buy it with my own money. And I don't want like a cheap one. I want to, I want like a, an actual skateboard that I can learn how to do tricks on. I'm like, all right, man. So we started looking at boards to try to see what was the standard now and what is like a, you know, not a Walmart special, but like a, a legit skateboard with good bearings and stuff. And so like he does, he got a new board bought a helmet and just like started watching videos about how to ollie and went out and started learning how to ollie and then he started learning how to shove it and so he put all of this time into learning these kind of the basic stuff for two weeks or so and then just like didn't touch it again mm. <laughs> so so we have a really nice tony hawk skateboard and a really nice helmet and you know i'm not but gonna it's there it maybe he'll pick but, it up again yeah yeah he probably will because as a like that. kid, you see one thing on on television or in a movie, and you're like, "That was cool! I want to go do that." And you'll you'll see some skater on there, and he'll be back at it. Oh yeah, I mean, I had that. You know, uh, Rad. I watched the movie I Rad so love many times. Rad. And it was yeah. like, now I'm a BMX guy, you know, and yeah. then gleaming the cube, and then now oh. I'm a skateboard guy. <laughs> Hell track. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, I love Rad. It's one of my favorite movies. I usually have like a some movie playing in the background in my videos, and it's kind of like a fun little thing where people are commenting on the movie, trying to guess what it is. I had Rad playing once. It's one of my childhood oh, nice. favorites. Yeah. yeah, that was one that I rented from the video store a lot. Like you know, probably ten or fifteen times. Go on Friday night. You know, you got to get there early enough to pick out the good movie before everybody else rents yeah. theirs. And is Robert De Niro in that? No, no. Josh Brolin's in that, right? I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I never even heard the movie before. You've never heard of Rad? Man. No, it's so, so is it a ska- skating movie? A uh, BMX movie. So the thing about oh, Rad yeah. is it didn't have distribution for like 25 years or something like that. So you could, so back in VHS days, you could run it. And of course, we copied everything that we rented back then. And so I've seen it a million times. And then. Um, I think throughout like the most of the 2000s, you couldn't get it legally anywhere, but you mm. could you could find versions of it. And then just uh, I think maybe two or three years ago, it finally got distributed, and now I own a digital copy of it. So you can you can now watch it legally if you want to. Nice. Yeah. Josh Brolin was not in that. What movie am I thinking of from that? Is there a Thrasher? Maybe I'm just goon. Oh, maybe. This is not important, but I really want to figure <laughs> it out. Our childhoods are very important. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's thrashing. 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 I said thrasher. Okay. Thrashing. Yeah. Josh Brolin's going to be on SNL this week, in case anybody cares. Oh. I, uh, we went to see Dune 2 last night, and he's in that. And Oh, that's why he's going to be in the public yeah, media yeah. for a minute. He's a, like, he's a menacing dude. Like, I don't know what he's like in real life, but as an actor, like he, he can really... Kind of scary. <laughs> but anyway, it was a good movie. Um, the skateboard thing is really cool. I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, the, 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 the crazy thing is, like, if you just look at a skateboard, you think, oh, two bends on the end. But it's got a um, a compound bend because the, the edges are all bent up, too. So this is my first time doing a compound bend. So did you – you might have said this already. Are you doing the, the press or the vacuum? I'm going to do the vacuum. Thing. I don't. I don't have the yeah, bottle jacks for the press, but there are other ways to do it. But I'm going to do. I'm going to do a vacuum. Yeah. When I did mine uh, a long time ago, I used the. I think it was the same vacuum bag that you used before the Rocket mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it worked great. Like it was, it, it worked not perfectly, but really well for the first attempt. When I and I did like the foam mold out of pink foam and yep. CNC'd it and stuff. Um, yeah, that was really cool. That was a long time ago, though. Let's see. What have I been up to? Um, I finished the ping pong table. Remember I was telling you about the yeah. convertible ping pong table? It's cool. Like it. Does it work well? It does work well. Oh, I, I cool. got done with it. I was by myself, you know. And I got done with it, got the top mounted and everything, and kind of off camera ran through the transformation and stood back and had like this oh wow kind yeah. of feeling I haven't had in a really long time it, yeah it felt great. really cool um, the base opens you know expands so it gets longer but then 
there's just a weird thing about the tabletop being centered on a base that can expand. You want it, it anyway. So I had to come up with a, a way to make the tabletop slide on top of a base that expanded. And so you yeah. have the tabletop does the or the bottom does this, and then the tabletop is mounted to one of those things, but can slide back and forth within a certain range, so that you can center the tabletop in both orientations. And it's really simple to do. It's like just a track that I. I screwed in on, on the underside of it so it's it hidden does, it sound the, does the table does the tabletop become level across the net yes oh nice so the net is an How add-on so it's like you clip it to the table yeah. um it turned out really cool i was really excited about it and kids came home and saw it after school and were like whoa because it looks like a mini ping pong table when it's flipped in half it's just half and so we were joking about putting the net up across a half table and playing like mini pong you know where you have like two feet of table that you can play across and stuff anyway so i was what working is, on that what is that a regulation done. what is a regulation ping pong table it is uh four and a half wide by nine feet long oh yeah that's big yeah so you know when it folds in half it's a basically a square table it's not exactly square but uh basically square and so it's really in getting the overhang, being able to slide the top around was a, a later addition, but it was so that when it's in half form, we can get people sitting up on all sides of it because it's a perfect size for playing like board games, you know, big mm. board games. It's a lot of space. Everybody has space in front of them. So it's a, it's a ping pong table. It's also a gaming table. It's got storage built into the underneath part that you can access from the outside. And even though it moves and, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so I worked on that, and that's that's done now. But I, I was curious if you guys have run into this, and maybe this is just right now. I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. I usually can stay pretty well focused on a few things. You know, if I have two projects that I'm working on, I can say I'm gonna. I'm going to switch focus to this one thing and get some stuff done on it and make progress. And then I can switch gears to something else. I can't go back and forth a whole lot, but I can stay focused pretty well. In the last few weeks, and especially this week, I find myself just getting really distracted by just any number of things. And it's, I know a lot of people struggle with that on a regular basis. You know, so I know it's not a new thing, but for me, it's kind of a new thing, and it's it's weird. I I realized a couple days ago, I was selling for me this last night. I I was sitting right here at the computer, and I was answering email stuff, and in it like like I woke up, like how did I get here? Like I don't mm-hmm. even remember coming into the office. I don't remember sitting down. I don't remember why I'm at the computer. I was in the shop just a minute ago, and I came in here for something, and then got distracted by something, and then sat down, and then did something, and then got distracted by something, and got you know, and it was really strange because that's a kind of a new thing for me. Is that's there something? Life. Is there something in the future that you're either excited about or scared of that that's on your mind? Hmm. That is yes. usually the thing. All of that, those? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can find That's so I, I'll find like. myself getting to that point when I'm really excited about something, whether it's work or or not, or really, or or on the opposite side of that, just afraid or scared or worried, and and then all of a sudden, like, oh yeah. How did I get here? I'm in my car. I'm I'm now in, uh, I'm at my destination. I don't remember getting here. That's scary. Mm. What was I thinking about the whole time? Yeah, I guess it's like your brain is just distracted enough, but your motor skills kind of take over, and you just yeah you know, doing something. How many how many times you open up? This happens to me a lot. You open up Instagram to look up somebody specific to try and communicate with them because now Instagram has become sort of an email service for a lot of us. And you open up Instagram to talk to somebody specifically, and then you just start scrolling. And then ten minutes go by, and you can't even remember who you went to talk to. And you got to go back to you got to go back a few steps to try and jog your memory to be like, oh yeah, I wanted to ask him about this. And then you go back in, and it happens again. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. happening. That does happen yep. to me, like on the phone. I think this 
was surprising because I physically didn't remember how I got here, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And my mind was thinking, oh, I need to go to the office to get something. And then I walked in here and probably saw a notification and then like, oh, check the notification. Oh, it's okay, cool. Oh, look, there's new email. Oh, I'll do, you know, and it was just one thing after another. But it, I didn't complete the task that I started to do. So it was like I had this unfinished kind of spinning plate that I hadn't, you know, grabbed. It was really strange, and it's happened a couple of times recently. So what I did yesterday, um, I, I started, you know, the since we recorded on a different day this week, my Wednesday morning is usually this, and so yesterday I had it kind of free. <clears throat> and so I, my day was starting, and I was like, I don't, I don't want to be distracted, and I think part of it might be because I know in my head that there's all of these things that are undone. There's... A huge mess in the shop from doing the ping pong table. There's a bunch of stuff that I've been meaning to move around just to get it out of the way. There's a bunch of stuff that needs to be thrown away. You know, uh, this big long list of these are outstanding tasks in my brain that are taking up space that are on my shoulder. And so in an attempt to try to like get rid of some of that and f- be able to focus, I was like, okay, I'm going to take an hour. I'm going to set a timer from nine to 10 this morning and I'm just going to clean. I'm going to pick one thing to do. And I'm not going to work. I'm not going to look at my computer. I'm not going to I put my phone down, turn on some music, and I just clean the shop for an hour. And eventually I looked at <clears throat> my watch, and it was like, it had only been like 45 minutes or something. It hadn't even been the full hour. And I'd gotten all this stuff cleaned up and put away and just tools put back where they needed to be. And it wasn't done. But I made so much progress on a single task by just putting down the distraction stuff And saying, this has an end time. I'm going to do this for an hour and no more. And at that hour, I'll decide whether I want to do more of it or do something else. And it was really productive to do it that way. Um, And I don't know that I can do that all the time, but for stuff like those outstanding tasks, like cleaning and organizing and stuff like that, I think I'm going to start trying to put in, maybe not every day of the week, but put in a couple of days a week, 30 minutes, an hour up front, first thing, to clear the mental load a little bit so that I can then be less distracted the rest of the day. That's my attempt, you know. Um, Because I think a lot of it is just outstanding tasks that are not important enough to take priority but are still taking up some brain space. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every morning I go for a 30-minute walk. No phone, no headphones, just a walk. And I'm not – I'm not – getting anything done except I'm clearing headspace. I'm just setting the tone for the day to not I gotta start doing that. That sounds like a good idea. I I should say uh, I use that time to think and it's it's that it's that part of the day where I'm there's no screen in front of me. There's no podcast. There's no book. There's nothing in my ear. Um, And it's just it's just me and what I'm thinking about what I'm going to do for the day. But there's usually no agenda. Sometimes I don't even think about the day. Sometimes I'll just think about random mm-hmm. stuff or I'm just looking at trees in the sky or whatever. It's just clearing out the toxins in my brain. Yeah. I think it, oftentimes I forget to charge my headphones when I go for a run. And so then I don't have music or audiobooks or whatever. And usually when that happens, <clears throat> unless I have something really pressing to that I need to think about, I will try to actively not think about anything, which is kind of a weird thing to do. But, you know, like, I'm not going to try to solve anything on this run. I'm just going to go and let my mind see where it goes. But I'm Mm going to, you know, try not to, like, plan or organize in my brain or make, you know, whatever. And that's kind of hard for me to do. But I think it's been beneficial the times that I just let my mind wander without kind of an agenda, you know, or anything to accomplish. But... Anyway, um, in in cleaning the shop yesterday, it it started setting off. I didn't really I didn't put this together until just now. It started setting off a bunch of. Um, oh well, you know what would be cool right here is a way to not have this mess in the future, and and a way to organize these materials are like, man, I have way too much of this stuff. I don't I don't need this. Like I haven't used this stuff since I've moved here. Like almost seven years ago, why do I still have these materials just taking up space? And it was a lot of that kind of stuff that I don't think I would have paid attention to if I was still holding that task out 
as like I'll get to it one of these days. So I think it was really productive, not only from cleaning, but also kind of taking inventory of what I have in the shop and a whole half of the shop needs to be kind of gutted and just like cleared out, throw away most of it and then figure out what needs to go back and what doesn't need to go back and what, what empty space could be used in another way. And I actually got a really cool idea. I'm not going to give away now, but, um, about like storage in a compressible way, uh, in the shop, which I think it's going to be really cool. So Mm. yeah, Hmm. it was, it was beneficial. And I think it was all a result of finding myself so distracted that I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> I'm like, I got to do something about this because that's not cool. Because it's a huge waste of time, you know, to like just to, I don't know when I sat down. I don't know how long I've been sitting here. I don't know how many emails I just got through. <laughs> that's a waste of time. That could be way more useful or just not on purpose. You yeah. know, it could be not useful on purpose. And I think that's beneficial as well. The storage in a compressible way reminded me of the 80s commercials of like the clothes hangers where you, you put all your clothes on the hanger and then um, th- then it... it um, oh, yeah, it hangs I, down, I, like I pivots down. Yeah, it, it pivots down so it just has one part that hangs on the on the hook but and then all the clothes compress. Does that thing still exist? I'm sure it does. Wait, what is that? Say that again? Uh, I'm not good at explaining the <laughs> mechanics of it. So let's say it's, it's a clothes hanger, but it's say it has 10, 10, 10 hooks for 10 different garments, right? And right. then they're all kind of hinged together. So you got the... You, oh, it's you, on you, one you rod? Hook, and so they, they fall down and yes. then that one rod yes. hangs on the... Yeah, that's the, like a way to carry a, a whole bunch on one piece of material, on one piece of steel, for instance. Yeah. I've seen that. So I just went to look that up because I was going to just try to send a picture to Jimmy in case he didn't understand. And hang on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Rabbit holes. No, did no. Simone, I mean, did Simone's so, ha- hanger pop up? Yeah. Well, Simone's hanger. Yeah. Where is it? Okay. So I'm trying to find, okay. So hers is on Kickstarter, but the first thing that came up when I, I searched for collapsible hanger, is a Timu ad for that same hanger that she designed. Oh, they're already stealing from it? She got ripped off so quickly. Oh, oh yeah. It's, is she making it yet? Uh, I don't know. Well. I mean, the it looks like the Kickstarter's probably over, so I would imagine she's... I don't know if they're out or not, but... And, it, you know, it's not exactly the same, but it's the same idea. Yeah. It's um, slightly different, but, man, that's so lame. Yeah. And yeah, I mean they're selling them for like three bucks a piece. I guarantee you, she's not selling them for three bucks a piece. Eight cents. Yeah, Timo seems like a, it's like a virus that's just everywhere. Every single time you open an app, it's like the first thing you see. Golly. I mean, you know, luckily she will still be able to sell them. I, I think I'm I'm finding that a lot. Where like anything you make is going to be made cheaper, faster, probably before you somewhere else. But there, I think there's still going to be the audience that doesn't necessarily want the cheaper version. They want your version, or they're they're like don't trust the cheapest version of something, you know, which mm-hmm. is probably smart. So I think she'll still be okay. But that's a bummer. Anyway, coat hangers, huh? Um, this is a really interesting conversation we're having today about skateboards and coat hangers. Um, so anyway, that's what I've been up to this week. And we did kind of have a topic, uh, which I don't know how we transition into that other than just go into it. Jimmy, you asked a question before we started. Oh, we were just joking about money and we say, how much is enough? And I always, when it comes to money, obviously more is better, but I always felt that I was being successful if all my bills were paid. And if I didn't, if I wasn't carrying thousands of dollars in credit card debt, which I don't carry anymore. When we first met, I used to always carry tons of credit card debt and that's all paid off now. And I don't have any of it. I never had to go bankrupt but what is when is enough enough and in life balance you could make a lot a lot of money there's there's ways of making more money you know when people complain about having money howard my partner and i always say work harder or come up with a cool idea that pays a lot with less effort and those are the two ways to make money just work harder at whatever it is you're good at 
and try and get more clients or income or come up with a cool idea like a bendable hanger, whatever that might be. And But how much is it? When is enough enough? If all my bills are paid and I still have a little bit of money to play with to either make some creative thing or to go buy some interesting thing to inspire me even further, I always felt like that was enough. Some people are driven to be multimillionaires and they have to constantly keep reinvesting. You know, there's a lot of this talk at WorkbenchCon about tax this and tax shelters and, and like I just zone out. So I'm like, you know what? I'm happy. I don't have to get into the minutia of all this stuff. Everything's okay. So for me, enough is enough because you kind of get caught up in that conversation. You're like, wait, am I doing enough? Am I, you know, I, I, do I need a tax shelter? I don't even care. That's why I pay somebody to do it for me and I don't even ever talk to them and I don't care. And I got plenty of money and I got all my things I paid for. And then someone's talking about, you know, well, if you do this little tax cheat and that's it. I'm just like, when is, when is enough enough? And then when it comes to subscribers and clicks, and when is enough enough? And I was having this conversation with Rachel on the drive home last night where it's, if I post something because it's really something I really feel is cool, and I just post it randomly throughout the day, versus posting every day or every other day at a specific time so that enough people can see it. Da, 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 da. You think to yourself, is... Is, is it enough to just put it out there if it doesn't get picked up by the wave and the algorithm, but it's something you feel cool about? And at least if several people that you're closest to will look at it and go, oh, I'm really inspired by that. I don't know what the answer is, but I tend to almost feel like I'm, I'm happy. I certainly would like to have more money to play with, but I feel like enough is enough at this point for me. And you know, the people that are constantly chasing the dragon and going for the numbers and the numbers and the numbers. And, you know, is part of that because I can't get any better? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm making an excuse. I don't know. But I think, I'm not well, sitting I, here, you know, I'm not sitting here in a wet diaper being like, Mwah, I guess yeah. this is good. I'm just wondering, Just it was just kind of a philosophical question. When is enough enough? Well, I think even that response to it, like, is that because I can't do any better? I think that is that is like a... I think that's a response to the pressure of you should be doing more. Yeah. And then and then your natural reaction is maybe I can't and maybe so maybe that's why I'm I'm okay with how things are at this moment. Yeah. But I think that's wrong. I think yeah, I I I've talked a little bit about the last couple of years for me and how I've changed a lot of my responsibility level and how much I want to accomplish. And one of the big things over the last year and a half for me was deciding, realizing, and then deciding that I just need to do fewer things just in general, you know, mm -hmm. not, and, and it's not like do a, a worse job at anything, not that I need to cut things out of my life, but I just need to do fewer things better. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of that I'm taking this year as well. Yeah, and I think part of that is coming to terms with, I mean, I can do a bunch of things poorly with the intent of making more money or trying to build like an empire or having, you know, with to some unknown financial end. But like, I'm going to be miserable all the way there. And that, I, it just, that's not, not Comes. even remotely worth <laughs> yeah. that kind of effort to me, you know. Yeah, And I think what I found in trying to make that decision, and this is me personally, obviously everybody's not going to be the same, but over the last six months or so, I have been happier, more relaxed, enjoying my work, content, way more than I was in the last uh, maybe 10 years. I don't, I don't know. I don't even know when to put a time on it, but letting go of that that feeling that you have to be doing more because the bottom might fall out or because everybody else is or because that's just what we do in our job like those are terrible reasons to do anything <laughs> you know like you 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 can't live in fear of things that you can't control 
you cannot keep up with other people because other people have entirely different businesses and lifestyles and personal choices and family situations. And there's like so many variables in any comparison that you try to make to anybody else in your job. It doesn't make sense to try to keep up with them. It's not realistic. And so if you don't, if you can take that pressure off of yourself of keeping up with people, then you get to decide what do I actually want for me, not not relative to other people like what do I actually want for me then you can a little bit more easily decide what is enough is it security is it a million dollars is it 10 million dollars is it not having to live month to month is it having enough food tomorrow you know what I mean like there's yeah. you get to decide that for yourself and I think I think it's a fantastic question for anybody to ask if for nothing else to start to separate what you actually want out of your time and out of your life and out of your weeks versus what everybody else is doing in theirs. So this is something that don't, I've don't go to work bench. Come. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I've, I've struggled with, uh, recently, not, not as far as, as money, but of what I do. And, so over the last year and a half, I've taken some pretty expensive courses with these YouTube gurus and I've learned like, oh, like this is how you find good ideas and this is how you execute. And some of those ideas worked really, really well. Like we were talking about Timu. I made a Timu video. I bought team rip off Timu products on uh, and, and made a video about it. That video it's got over a million views. And then I bought all the wind tools and that video's got, you know, a half a million views and they're spectacle videos and they work. Tool reviews, tool comparison videos, they work. And something I realized recently is I don't like making them. I don't, it feels like I'm eating a candy bar when I make them. It's satisfying to get the views, mm. but when I go to look at, like, if I go to my my channel page and I look at and I list videos by latest, I'm like, I'm not proud of everything here. Like, I, I, I'm sort of embarrassed by some of them. And I, I, I so I, I've gone through this change mentally recently of like, I want to focus more on making crazy stuff. And sometimes making crazy stuff doesn't get the views that... So spectacle videos do I'm going to figure out how to make that work because whether I get 50,000 views or a half a million views I'm going to be okay so the so the, so the stereo stand I think was kind of like this is we're starting with the stereo stand we're going to do things outside the box and then we uh made the the tambor cabinet thing with no no corners and now i'm doing the skateboard thing i really want to focus on being more creative and maybe i i'm hiding the the art pieces behind tutorials so the skateboard video is probably going to be a why you need a vacuum press in your shop and we're going to go over why this is my favorite clamp in the world and then we're going to put it to use and then i'm going to make what i want to make so i i, I can feel good about what i what i want to do and so um, I can't say that I won't do tool comparisons and tool review videos in the future because sometimes they're easy to make and sometimes it's it's easy money. But for right now, I'm like I really want to focus on on the creative stuff, and that's that's just kind of where I'm at mentally. Yeah, I mean that makes total sense too. You know, I I think you take those two things. You got like tool reviews or whatever the kind of generic non heart video you know that you could make anybody could make and then you have the thing that you really care about it is absolutely reasonable to think <clears throat> i have to do these so that i can do these one pays for the other and that's how most jobs work yeah i don't think that's a bad thing you know what i mean but i i think probably the is is it enough mentality comes in where like I'm going to avoid making the art stuff because I could replace that video with another tool review, review video and it's going to make twice as much money and like that's money and I could get more money and then I could put more money into more money and then I, you know. So 
obviously we all have to pay bills. We have to take sponsorships. It's the exact same thing, right? Mm -hmm. You have to do something you wouldn't naturally do because it pays for the thing that you would naturally do. And I don't think that's even something to like consider as, as a negative thing, but the end result, the, the final outcome of your efforts is that going to satisfy you? Is that going to be something that you're going to be able to stop at the end of the day and be like, yeah, cool. I'm done for today. Mm -hmm. Or is it just, I'm never going to have enough. I'm never going to be able to make enough videos, have enough views, you know, or why can't I have as much as other people have? And I mean, to be perfectly honest and transparent here, when I look at some of the other people who've been YouTube doing YouTube stuff that we do, a lot less time than what we do and they get like 10x 20x views for kind of similar content i'm like my first reaction is naturally like what in the why can't i get that and then i'm like wait a minute we're different people mm -hmm. <laughs> with different audiences any similarities are accidental and pretty slim they are different people and good for them that they get that that doesn't mean that i need to get that too and it doesn't say anything bad about me that I don't get those kinds of views. And I think being able to realize that those are different things is difficult, but pretty important, you know, to separate that out. Um, because like you said, David, if, if you do something that you actually really enjoy and the views are not there, you still got to do it. And yeah. if that's your goal, then like that's enough, right? You've got to do the thing. And if you can pay your bills along the way, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you know, that's great. But I think it's a struggle. I mean, even looking, you know, this is one of those situations where, like, the three of our lives are different. When I look at my kids and I think about, you know, their futures and their college cost and even, like, right now, being able to do all the things for them and with them that we want to do, it's expensive. It, it costs a lot of money to put four people into the world and set them up for the best you can set them up for. And so a lot of my perspective of is it enough is can I be stable enough for them to have the life that I want them to have? You know, can I make enough to provide for them the things I want to provide for them. And that's not any different than like a spouse or you know, family members or anything, you know, you're providing for someone, it's the same thing. But that does add a whole nother level of, I can do things for me, but I also have to do things for them. And sometimes that means, you know, I'm not going to work myself to death. I'm not going to take on sponsorships that I don't believe in or anything like that. But enough for me is security and provision and so those are the priorities that I have when I'm making decisions about the things that I do and how much of it I do can I provide provision can I provide security to a point you know for my family and for myself and for my you know employees and things so there's a lot that goes into answering that question and obviously it's different for everybody but I know for me over the last year or so trying to Trying to answer that question for myself has been eye-opening and really beneficial, and I think has has set my life in a better direction. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Realizing enough is enough. What you have yeah. is instead of chasing the dragon. Sometimes enough is too much. Hmm. Too. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really easy to get caught up and think that you have to have, or the things that you thought you had to have actually are weighing you down. You know. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm not buying cars this year. <laughs> Your truck collection I, is weighing you down. I went, to, I went to go trade in my, my truck a couple of weeks ago, and I went in, and we did the financing and everything, and I was just like, what's the point? You know, I really need to just scale back. And I didn't. I was going to trade in my 2018 for a new truck for, for a Suburban. I still want that, but now is not a good time to do it. I need to get a little bit more. I need to basically just cut the budget a little bit. And that's just because I'm... I find myself overextending because I'm too casual about buying things. I'm not in any trouble, but I would be if I keep going this casual about things. So looking and at it's easy to happen. Like, 
Yeah, that's super like, easy to have when you have like a good, you know, good season, and you're like, oh yeah, yeah. I got money to. Like, yeah. Yep. It's funny in the toy business, we watch so many toy companies rise and fall, and when they rise, the first thing they do is they get like the posh office or the best <clears> showroom <throat> at the toy center, and. My brother always said, you'll notice a toy company starting to have problems when they stop giving away free drinks. And you go to the office and they say, oh, you want a soda? What do you want? Well, you, want a, you want a seltzer? What do you want a coffee? And then you go, like, after, like, having meetings with them over the course of, like, a year, and they'll be like, yeah, we don't have anything to drink. If you want, we could send somebody down to get you coffee. Because yeah, they, like, shut the kitchen down. <laughs> <And> that's, <laughs> that's when the, the accountant starts reeling it in. It's like, do we need to buy five cases of soda a week? Let's not do that. Let's not keep the, everything all the snacks around and it's really funny because it's a thing when they stop stacking the fridge that's when they start tightening the belt so before i get there i don't want to have to stop buying waters and soda for the house <laughs> <laughs> so if i come to visit you and you don't offer me something to drink i'm gonna know yeah. so the milk one's right across the way if you want to go get some <laughs> i'll be right here bob you shouldn't go visit him you should drive by hang out with his friends in the neighborhood, send them some photos, and then leave. I should go see Derek. Yeah, there you That's go. That's what I go should see. do. Derek would love for you to come see him. Oh, man. He would love that. He had a really good I time with Derek. He had a really, really good time with, with Jocko. He said uh, he didn't expect to have so much of, so much of a nice time. And like, he wanted to give Jocko his space. You know, Jocko is a very complicated, exotic animal. <laughs> got to be careful with Jocko. <laughs> he really is. And I mean that in the best way. And... And uh, Derek said they had a really nice time together. A lot of inspiration going both ways. and That's how Derek that's cool. put up the movie. If you see Derek's Instagram, he put up a movie of him making an old sort of railroad camp lamp into an LED, battery-operated LED. Jocko helped him with that video. Jocko, I think, shot that whole video for him just to give him some lessons on film editing. Cool. I did yeah. see that. I didn't. I don't think I realized that Jocko shot it, but... Cool. Well, any other thoughts on on this topic from you guys? I talked a whole lot, and I'm sorry for that. But yeah, no, I'm I'm gonna I, when enough is enough. I used to think that. Well, it really started during the pandemic. I was putting a video out every single week, and I'm not doing that now. I'm gonna wait till I have something really good to put out. And if it happens to be two, three weeks in a row, that's fine. But if it's not, then I'm gonna be okay with that. You know, I felt I used to rush to produce something every single week, just because I developed that schedule. And but now I'm gonna put out quality over quantity. I'm gonna try that. Occasionally, I might have an interesting video that just pops up, and I'm going to publish that. But here it is, several weeks now since I published my last video because of travel and whatnot. But I'm, I got a few ideas I'm going to start working on this weekend. And I'm not going to rush to finish them by next weekend if they're finished. One of them is finished. One of them is finished. That's how I'm going to take this year. I think uh, final thoughts from myself, me giving myself advice is it's okay to change your mind all the time and feel this way about it today. Maybe I'll feel different about it tomorrow. And that's cool. Go with the flow. Yeah, absolutely. Right on, cool. Well, um, I'm gonna thank our Patreon supporters because no matter how many times we change our mind, they're still here and that's awesome. Yes. <laughs> Big thanks to them for uh, being supporters. And you know, we do have people come and go, but there's always people there to support the show and <clears throat> We are very, very grateful for that. Uh, the top supporters over there, been around for a long time, Crabtree Creative, Michael Manegin, Warren Works, Jeff at the New Janky Workshop, Scott at Dad It Yourself DIY, Sean Beckner, Odin Leather Goods. Sean sent me some something recently. He was helping with something. I can't remember. Thank you, Sean, for the message that you sent. I can't think of what it was at this moment, but thank you. Um, Rich at Loan Designs, Chad's Custom Creations, Chad from Mancrafting, Works by Solo, Albers Woodworks, Corey Ward, and Nick Ryan, but also people like Kevin Eller. Another Thank one you, Kevin. Patreon I met the new Janky Workshop at WorkbenchCon, and they were such a lovely couple. They were so nice. So oh, thank cool. you, guys. I was on a call with them one time for. Um, he's on the. I like to make stuff Patreon as well. Very nice guy. Um, do you have anything to recommend? This Dave, week. you go first. So, I got an idea. So I'm going to go with the website SkateCAD, which is fantastic. And then their actual website is called Open Source Skateboards. And same with their YouTube channel. Uh, when I say they, it's it's basically it's it's one dude. His 
from what I understand. And uh, just open source skateboards. That's that's such an amazing concept. And it just makes me so happy that there's somebody out there doing this to help other people yeah. get into this. That's very cool. Well, at WorkbenchCon, there was me and Izzy were there, and Steve Ramsey was there. And somebody pulled us together and said, let's do a picture for the guys that have 10 plus years. And that was us three. But also, Ch Chops with Chris was there as well. And some for some reason, Chris wasn't near us, and he didn't get in the picture. But Chris has been on as long as Steve Ramsey, 16 years. So shout out to Chris from Chops of Chris. If you don't know Chris, he's he's doing a lot of ASMR. Is it ASMR videos? Is that the sound? He says he's doing well with making videos with just the audio of the saws. He said a lot of people are tuning in. So huh. check out Chops with Chris, who does everything by hand, no electric. And in a little interview I do with him, I joke around. I say, he's making tools. And I said, how do you make a drill press or a mechanical lathe, all pedal powered, without a lathe without a south bend lathe for instance to make collets and mandrels and he goes bite your tongue i never use electric for anything so he's making tools with <laughs> pedal power tools making wow. other tools with, for pedal power tools so check out if you don't know chris he's one of the ogs he always wears a yellow notre dame shirt because he played on notre <laughs> dame oh did he i didn't know that i thought he just yeah, like, yeah. went went to the school oh, no no he was a, he was a, at this in this little interview i there's some things i don't want to show because it shows his full name and everything uh but because that's a secret for, he doesn't want anybody to know that but uh i saw all his memorabilia he's he's got a, a hmm. beautiful setup of his memorabilia from his days at notre dame in 89 wasn't chris part of a podcast many years ago i don't was he uh, i don't know i don't remember I can't think of the name of it. I think it was with Tom and um, oh, shoot. It'll come to me later. And I could be totally wrong. I have a terrible memory, but I'm pretty sure he had podcasts way before we had a podcast. Hmm. Oh, maybe. Yeah, that's funny. Because I said to him, I go, I know. He, I said to him, I go, I know you've been here longer than me. I've been at it for about 12 or 13 years. I said, how long have you been at it? I thought he was going to say 14 years. He says, no, I started right when YouTube started. That's when I started. He said, just started wow. making videos right there and then. 2006 so he said maybe right thereabouts or just right after that i got my channel in 2006 but i didn't do anything with it until 2010 or 11 2011 is when i started playing with it i just Crazy. secured my name because i was doing a tv show at the time and they're like make sure no one steals your name on this new thing called youtube so i just parked hmm. my name hmm. well um mine is a very different kind of video but it's and it's four and a half hours long Cool. But, uh, <laughs> it is an intro to DaVinci Resolve. So it's a it's an online course, a free four and a half hour, pretty deep dive. I haven't watched it all yet, but um, what is getting DaVinci somebody Resolve? started. Resolve? So it's a video editing software, free oh. video editing software, that, which is incredibly powerful. We we used Final Cut for a really long time, and over the last year and a half, two years maybe, we've been switching over to resolve and i mean it's a different workflow but it's really powerful they use it for you know lots of feature films and stuff like that but the fact that there's a free version of it that is basically fully featured uh for the entire process of making a feature film i think is one of the big things and you know switching from another piece of software to or from one to another of any editing suite is hard because you have like muscle memory and you have shortcuts and all that type of stuff. And so this guy named Casey Ferris has a, a channel that's all about, uh, I think it's all resolve stuff. It may just be video stuff in general, but he does a lot of resolve videos and he just put out last week, like a four and a half hour masterclass. So you can just learn it for free, which is pretty awesome. So, um, you know, if you're, looking to get into it, that's a good place to start. And if you don't want to watch the four and a half hour version, he has a bunch of <laughs> individual tutorials as well. Yeah. I'm just going to put a little warning because it came up at WorkbenchCon. Some guys are using catfishing. They're catfishing and they're using f free something something for DaVinci Resolve. That's how Matthias got hooked. So you've got to be careful. If you're, if you're a creator and you're out there and someone says, hey, would you do an advertisement or would you be interested in promoting DaVinci Resolve? 
be careful because oh. that could be the catfishing guys because that's how that's how matthias got hooked and that's how my friend over at that works uh matt stagmer got hooked from da vinci huh. resolve mm. interesting so just be careful that's all don't click on any links and if yeah. they want to do an advertising with you just say email me or call me don't click on anything just write back and say if this is a real thing email me or call me direct call me directly and we'll talk about it so we get around that i've actually gotten that email before don't click now on that it. i'm thinking about it yep i have huh interesting i knew it was what like is the email from that was a long time is it like a xyzpdq.cz.hl? Yeah, it's one of those, HL? Like, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, I can't find it now. I just had it. It just infected anyway. your life. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those, yeah, like .pz or yeah. something. Well, you guys want to hear something? While I was away this week, I got an email that says, we need you on the Joe Rogan podcast. I was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> And so I clicked on it. It's like, choose, it's not the, it says Joe, it says a whole paragraph about who Joe Rogan is, as if nobody knows who he is. And then it's like, we're going to do a Facebook live session. Would you pick your session? Joe loves you. He loves what you do. Could pick a session so you could talk to him live on Facebook. And there's like seven things to click on, like dates. And I write back, I'm like, this is really cool. Who's Joe Rogan? So I got into a little conversation with him. We're going back and forth. It's like, great. We're going to give you the 13th of March at this time. Just click it to lock it in. And I was like, great. I'm going to be there. Awesome. And I said, what should I wear? And they're right back, wear casual clothes, but I just really need to lock you in. Just click this link right here. And I was like, great, I'll see you there. <laughs> and then this morning I get the email back. It just says, just following up, need to know that you're going to lock it in. And I was like, great, I'll see you there. I haven't clicked on anything. I'm just baiting them. I'm a little nervous to even open the email again. But that was just before we started. I said, great, I'll see you then. And they're trying to get me That's to click funny. on to like secure my space in the calendar. Yeah. Just log in with your social security number. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I guess that's it. Unless you guys got anything Another else. good therapy session. Yeah. Yeah. yeah enough always. is enough. Enough is enough. <laughs> it is. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank we'll see you next time. Uh, love, love you. Love you.